the Vygotskyan perspective on computers. It's a medium of communicate. It's a medium of communication. Mm -hmm. Even, so people would often use the expression to have a conversation with a computer. And we said, it's all, when you do it with a computer, there's always a person behind it. There's a, it's just, that's just an intermediary part of the system. And there, the, so that when you, yeah, so for us it was just, uh, initially, it was a purely practical matter. Mm -hmm. right? um, UCSD had internally these large uh, dedicated lines from you know, a fairly big computer box to some other computer box. And I was stuck on campus a lot because the communication program needed an enormous amount of attention when I first came. Like the job you were stepping into, except there was no communication department. Mm -hmm. Program and it was very contentious, and it was very way underfunded, illegally underfunded, and well, it, literally. I mean, and according to the rules of the university, oh, large and by a large amount, it was two and a half faculty, and it should have been thirteen. That's oh, a, that's a, yeah, that's a lot. And so it was a lot of work, um, but it it created the opportunity to bring in people and make a department because you had all these open positions and you had to negotiate all the time to get them back, but you could get you could get them back. And but I was very tied up on campus and I could only go out to the research site like once at up it's about 25, 20, 20, 20 miles from 25 miles from UCSD, up a freeway. It takes mm -hmm. a while to get there. Uh, and I could only go once a week. And so if you're going to coordinate, and then we had lab meetings twice a week at that point. I was carrying over from Rockefeller where you didn't have all the teaching requirements and stuff that you have at UCSD. And um, internally to UCSD, I could coordinate with people by using this little message system that they had worked out on hardwired computers, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in order to coordinate, I got all the different people who were involved with the lab to have accounts on that. And so we would tell each other what we did during the day just to coordinate because there was a lot of moving parts. And almost immediately we noticed that in among the purely Gilavi uh, messages that we had that uh, there was ideas. Oh, I, I, ideas started to circulate and graduate students were listening to those ideas and then could contribute to those ideas. So we quickly caught on to the fact that, hey, there is a lot of potential here for education, but, but not so much one kid at a computer, but using the computers in this way that was partly you did stuff that was programmed on the computer, but you also did stuff that was using the computer to communicate with other people. And then we actually created uh, uh, for a while, for our introductory course in communication, we had an extra two-unit writing section mm -hmm. that, that, we, that, that satisfied, until they took it away from us, that satisfied the writing requirement for undergraduates. But if they had to be taking communication, the introduction, and they spent their time, a, a lot of their time writing emails back and forth about the readings and discussing ideas, and then I taught, so we sort of taught them how to cut and paste them and that they could have half-baked ideas in conversation, save them, and then use that material as they were writing their papers. So that we, and we did it on the content of the course because um, often writing programs have relatively arbitrary content. You know, what do you do on your summer vacation? What do you, uh, yeah. And this wasn't like, like that at all. This would be, you know, is it true that he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future, and um, stuff like stuff like that. So it was, uh, and we had this guy that Don was a student of Don Norman's, just gotten his degree. Jim Levin was a sort of computer guy over there, and knew about this stuff. So we hired him part time. We could only hire part time people. I hired him as a temporary lecturer, and, in, and but also in the lab, and uh, he was an important leader. And then Peg Griffin, very early on, made herself into an expert on it. So there were sort of two different people, different orientations, somewhat. 
Um, and yeah, we were there right literally at the beginning. So, yep. Yeah. You know, Apple Apple II is about as elementary as you can get. I I actually, as you're talking, I'm thinking, Uryu has this term, it's called runaway object of activity. Yeah. Right? So, the, which which means practically that the sometimes activities are created for object, but then object, like computer, becomes so overwhelming and enables yeah. some other activities to be created around it. So right. Like, yeah, I hadn't like, thought of that in that way, but the comp certainly the history has shown with the, that the computer has, has transformed lots and lots of lots and lots of humor of, of human activity. We use the term runaway object um, in the paper we did about um, moving from design experimentation to uh, uh, reciprocal appropriation. Mm -hmm. right? There's a we have a paper where we talk about implementing a fifth dimension versus going into a place and just spending time with people. Mm -hmm. That started out in a particular center. But be as we began that way, the problems that the people faced, like we were there ostensibly to help the kids after school engage in activities that would be useful to them in school and out, wherever it would be useful, but literacy, numeracy activities. But we didn't go in with that as like saying we'll do the fifth dimension because it was physically impossible and in terms of the population, it was it wasn't possible, and so just walking in and we did just about anything, and but that quickly brought up issues of he people's health. So we started a garden, then we got uh, somebody coming in from the health thing. Then it started up local garden movements. Then it, there are other. It, it's just the whole thing. You're, you're starting from the life of a, a relatively poor community in subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. very unstable group of people and the number of problems that they're encountering are endless and you're worried about the kids but you can't solve the problem of the kids yep right so and so i think yeah in a way um part of what corralled the computer stuff it was it was focused on education and it was focused on elementary school we didn't and and then college students so we Obviously, we were interested in the college students, but um, and there, in the first years of the fifth dimension, the college students often took the fifth dimension course because it said that you would be working with kids in the community, and it didn't say anything about computers, and they were terrified. They were running away from computers, so we we ended up in the in the beginning having to develop new activities to support the students to learn what they needed to learn. Mm -hmm. Not the kids, the students. It's like, yeah. Very, 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 very interesting. Yeah. I, before we talk about fifth dimension, I still want to talk a little bit about pre or like a first uh, reiteration of the first dimension. You and I, just because I'm so curious, who come up with the wizard, right? Which was already happening. The idea of wizard and what is supposed. Well, to that came that, that the that we have pretty good descriptions of that. In the, there's pretty good description in the the. Uh, I think in the autobiography, um, but there are also published descriptions. If you like, click on the links and you want to read about it. It's there. Okay. But but the but the um, the idea of fifth dimension really came from um, uh, well, it was Peg Griffin's idea was a general idea. But in trying to build this alternative sort of we call it a play world now, we were very influenced by observing uh, kids playing Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. My son played Dungeons and Dragons. And there you have a kind of wizard-like character. Mm. Uh, and so we, and we wanted to have something that was, in some sense, out of this world. That was not real, but that would be treated as real. Mm -hmm. Because it was part of making this into a distinctive form of activity. With Now Martin and I are writing about this in terms of institution. Actually, we didn't realize that we were sort of creating an institution of the fifth dimension itself. We never thought of it that way. We thought of it as sustaining an activity. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to think of it in terms, more institutional terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as well. I mean, not, it's not a choice of one, really, of, of one or the other. Um, and we, at the time that we, we got put, we didn't start out to work in after school. We got pushed into it because the teachers, we tried to follow 
the same methods that we'd used in New York. It, but just to be very uh, systematic about it, so we had a classroom of kids who were in a special classroom because they were failing to read. Second graders through sixth graders, roughly in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would videotape in the classroom. We would take them, go to the play, go to the playground with them. We'd go try to see them at home, and the, you know, see them in a number of different settings to try to understand when was it that these difficulties, so-called general learning difficulties, when did they appear, and how were they related to print? Uh, but we weren't engaged in teaching at all. It was just an ethnographic study, very much like what Marianne Hedegaard does now, where she looks at kids in school, she looks at them in preschool, she looks at them at home, she yeah. looks at what happens with them. Mm -hmm. And um, the teachers in those classrooms, well, first thing we discovered, this is Bud Meehan was with us, so that's interdisciplinarity, he's a sociologist. And he was here, and that was one of the reasons that UCSD was attractive to me, that Bud was here. Uh, and um, uh, he did a study of, we, we gave IQ tests to all the kids who were in this class, and they showed this classic difference between quantitative and verbal IQ tests, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sort of LD kind of thing, but they were enormously heterogeneous. And the, we realized the teachers were in an impossible situation because they had this very heterogeneous group of kids the only thing in common was they were learning how to read. So the teachers actually asked us to stop the taping because they didn't 